Well, we've had fun over the last uh, 23 years uh, proving that cold fusion is real and defeating the uh, prime directive that David uh, so well described. <laughs> but now we have to get back to business and explain this puppy. So I'm not a theoretician. I did not come to theory uh, voluntarily. I came in desperation. And the, I, I read all the papers. Um, there's about 2,000 now that you really need to master. Um, I uh, did hundreds of experiments, only a few of which worked, only enough to keep me interested. And um, I, I had the impression that nature was playing games because uh, I get very discouraged and then nature would relent and make one work just in time. <laughs> so I realized that I, I needed help from theory. So I read all the theories and I was uh, really disappointed because most of the theories either violate basic laws that I was taught they don't mess with. Uh, they explain only one observation and ignore all the rest. Or they have a whole raft of ad hoc assumptions that are connected by complex, complex mathematics. So I didn't find them very useful. So I was uh, essentially forced, screaming and kicking, to develop a theory of my own which you'll hear about today, if you're patient. The, uh, a theory is always based upon an assumption. And if the assumption is wrong, it doesn't matter how clever the math is, the theory will be wrong. For example, if you assume that the sun goes around the Earth, it doesn't matter how much complex math you apply to that, that theory is going to crash and burn. And that's also true of any theory having to do with cold fusion. So I will describe four assumptions, and you can decide whether or not they're rational or reasonable. So we have a problem right at the start, because the name of the field, the name of the phenomena, is not even agreed. Uh, between people in the field. So I will call it cold fusion simply because it's easier to say than low energy nuclear reaction. And I'm describing a single phenomenon. I'm not describing hot fusion, um, hydrino reactions, uh, zero point energy, a magnetic energy. I'm explaining just one. Those all might be real and they might in fact occur during cold fusion but we have to separate them out and talk about one phenomena. And that phenomena is a nuclear process initiated on rare occasions in apparently ordinary material without application of significant energy that generates heat and nuclear products without the expected radiation when any isotope of hydrogen is present. That's, that's a lot to remember, but we'll try to apply that. All right, the first assumption is that cold fusion cannot occur in a normal material but requires formation of a unique condition. Everyone who has gone through graduate school and possibly even um, undergraduate is taught that nuclear reactions simply are not initiated in ordinary material. It just doesn't happen. I mean, there's geological evidence. There's, there's heroic efforts, as David described, that fail. It is not easy to do. Yet it happens. So we have a problem. How do we explain that conflict? The way I explain it is that I assume that something changes within the material and I call that change the creation of a nuclear active environment. Now we won't talk about the nature of the nuclear active environment at this point. We'll just simply say that we require something other than <coughs> ordinary material. The second assumption, the heat energy and nuclear products are produced by the same basic process operating in the same nuclear active environment. In other words, there's one operation, one mechanism, one place where it happens. We're not talking about a variety 
there are some people that like to make up all kinds of possibilities, but I choose to simplify this and talk about one kind of reaction. And we'll see if it's possible to explain it that way, or do we have to introduce a lot of complexity? And the third assumption is that cold fusion is not hot fusion. Now, the belief that cold fusion was hot fusion caused a lot of confusion early on and a lot of the rejection. And let's look at that in more detail because that's a very important mantra. Cold fusion is not hot fusion. And of course the reverse is true. Hot fusion is caused by um, two deuterons, in this case, coming together with high kinetic energy to combine into a uh, single nucleus, which immediately explodes. It explodes into four fragments. One of the fragments is a neutron, which can get out of the apparatus, and that's what's measured. Another fraction is uh, another fragment is helium three, which is absorbed and, and disappears. Tritium is radioactive; it accumulates, and so you can measure its presence by its accumulated uh, radioactivity. And then the proton also is absorbed. These all come off with high energy, and so there's a conservation of energy here. This is normal type nuclear reaction. Well, let's look at contrast this with cold fusion. Cold fusion is two deuterons come together with hardly any energy. And when they combine together, nothing happens. You just get helium-4. The heat energy comes out. Maybe a little radiation comes out. There's no obvious way that energy can be conserved by that process. And that's the big problem in trying to explain cold fusion. Nevertheless, that's what is observed. So let's look at uh, this in more detail because it's very important. Hot fusion is made a number of different ways. And we'll contrast that with how cold fusion is made. It's caused to occur. Um, Hot fusion is made to occur in an intense plasma controlled by a magnetic field. This is ITER, that's the technique that is presently being developed for power generation, uh, into which possibly $50 billion has already been invested. And it has so far not succeeded in making any useful energy. The laser-induced plasma, um, that also has not produced any useful energy, although it's justified based on nuclear weapons research. The Farnsworth fuser uses an electric field instead of a magnetic field. Uh, people think that might be useful as a source of energy, but it's only so far generated neutrons, which is very useful, but not for power production. Bubble collapse fusion, or sonofusion, here, uh, an acoustic wave is caused to pass through a liquid, uh, heavy water. The uh, bubbles that are formed collapse, and just before they disappear, the energy is concentrated enough that a hot fusion reaction is said to occur. It's called sonoluminescence because you get a, light, a pulse of light at that point. Fractal fusion, or, or piezonuclear fusion, occurs whenever a crack forms in a material that has deuterium in it. If you take a uh, lithium deuteride, which is very similar to salt, and smash it with a hammer, you will get a burst of neutrons. Cavitation fusion is a com combination of these two. Now, muon fusion is very interesting because uh, it has been related to cold fusion. I think we need to eliminate that, um, that confusion. Muon fusion results because the muon has a charge equal to the electron, but it's 200 times heavier. So it can form a molecular structure in the same manner as an electron does, but that molecular structure between two deuterons brings the two deuterons so close together that they can fuse. But the process is hot fusion. It's not cold fusion. You get all the products that are typical of the hot fusion reaction. You can also say, well, all these uh, involve application of energy, and this is, occurs in the cold, so therefore, you know, it must be cold fusion. 
you can look upon it somewhat differently and say the energy, instead of being applied as kinetic energy, as in these cases, it's applied as mass. And the mass now is used to bring the two closer together by forming this molecular structure. That's quite different than the way cold fusion works. Energetic ion bombardment is very interesting. Oh, I was afraid that might happen. Here, here we have an example of putting uh, figures in using a Macintosh and presenting it on a Mac. Mm -hmm. So I, I will have to explain to you what we have here. The, uh, we have two graphs. The first graph shows the, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the rate of reaction of the fusion reaction in a plasma. And it's a log scale. You can see that clearly. <laughs> and on the horizontal axis is energy. And that's the kinetic energy that's being used. And you'll, you'll notice that there's a green line here that goes down so, and drops off very uh, rapidly as you go to lower energy. Now that's typical hot fusion. Now down here we have a graph that shows the excess over that reaction. In other words, how much additional fusion rate one would have under the different conditions as a function of, again, energy. And you will notice that as you go along at you know, modest energies, maybe around anything above 15 kilovolts, the uh, rate that you get when you bombard zirconium, or in fact almost any material, with deuterons, the rate of the hot fusion reaction is constant and, and, and equal to that which you would get from this curve. But when you get below about 15 kilowatts, it starts to rise, and you get an enhancement. Now people have said, well, that enhancement is a transition to cold fusion. No, it's not, because it is, in fact, even in this region, hot fusion. And furthermore, this rise is very trivial. It looks big when you plot it this way, but if you plotted it on this log scale, it would just be a slight deviation because the rate at which it's the uh, rate at which the uh, fusion reaction is dropping with, with energy is very, very rapid. So you never get to the levels, even no matter how much extrapolation you do, to the levels that have been found in cold fusion cells. So we can forget about that as an explanation. Okay, let's talk about the way in which cold fusion is made. Cold fusion uh, is made by exposing material to electrolysis. That's the fleischmann pons effect. Exposure of material to gas discharge. Exposure of material to sonic bombardment, the stringham effect. In this case, the acoustic wave makes a bubble, but rather than have it collapse within the, the liquid, it collapses against the target. And so the content of the bubble is injected into the target, and it's the cold fusion reaction then occurs in the target, not in the bubble. We can expose a material that has been activated to just simply the gas itself. Now, all of these essentially are techniques for bringing into a, a, a solid environment the reactant, the prote proteum or the deuterium. Now, we also find that electromigration uh, enhances, causes the effect. In other words, if you put a voltage across a material, it can be a, an oxide that, that dissolves deuterium or it can even be a metal, causing the ions to move you can see an extra amount of energy. Even simply passing uh, deuterium through palladium by normal concentration gradients has been shown to produce a small amount of extra energy. And we'll talk about why that happens a little later. So you can see that there is a vast difference between the hot fusion and the cold fusion in the way, it, in the kinds of products, and the way it's caused to occur. So if I were teaching a course, I would ask everyone to repeat after me 10 times, hot fusion is not cold fusion. Cold fusion is not hot fusion. And in fact, as I would ask you as a homework assignment to say that before you go to bed tonight, it will help you sleep. 
All right, there's one other uh, assumption, and that is that all laws that we presently know and love are followed by cold fusion. It does not violate anything. Everything we know can be applied to explaining cold fusion. Now, obviously something's missing, and the challenge is to identify that missing part, not come up with all kinds of strange and wonderful explanations that violate the various laws. Let's just stay with what we know at this point. Now, the cold fusion phenomena has three separate parts that we can identify and evaluate separately. We have to, we have to make the nuclear reactive environment. Because that's occurring in a chemical lattice, it follows all the rules of a chemical reaction. It therefore has to form, gives energy to occur. So, whatever you imagine to be the nuclear reactive environment, you have to satisfy that rule. Otherwise, forget it. Once the nuclear reactive environment is formed, the deuterons or the protons have to go into it, have to enter into it and form a structure. Individual atoms will not fuse. They only fuse when they come together. When something comes together, it is, in fact, what's called a molecule or a chemical structure. And that's what we have to make. And that also has to follow the same rules of chemistry because it is occurring in a chemical lattice. It also has to generate Gibbs energy. And finally, once that structure is formed, it immediately goes about fusing. It immediately goes about bringing the, atom, the nuclei together <coughs> and radiating the energy by some process that we'll talk about very shortly. Now, I won't go into um, talk about Gibbs energy. I, I want to spend a little more time talking about the theory. But if anybody doesn't know what the Gibbs energy is, please see me afterwards. I'll give you a short tutorial. We also have to satisfy the law, second law of thermodynamics, the laws of probability and conservation of momentum. And if you don't know what those are, then ask me later. OK. So if you apply these assumptions to all the theories, you discover that something's missing. So we have to think about something, uh, an explanation that's different. So let me summarize first my explanation. And then we'll go into more and more detail um, until hopefully your patience is exhausted. <laughs> first of all, the nuclear active environment I'm claiming is a gap having a criti critical size that is created by stress release. Now, I came to that conclusion um, by process of elimination because there are only a limited number of ways in which you can modify a chemical system. And we have to modify it in, in, in conventional ways in order to make this. But it has to have a characteristic that allows other uh, things to apply. So the only thing I could see was common to all experimental methods and experimental conditions were cracks. But it's not just any old crack, because large cracks will um, are bad. They, they're obviously dead, because you can form the hydrogen molecule, and we know the hydrogen molecule is dead. So you have to form some form of hydrogen short of and different from the hydrogen molecule. The, um, I'm saying that the hydrogen, when it gets into this gap, forms a covalent chain, which I call a hydrogen, um, with the release of Gibbs energy. And that stabilizes the gap, because energy was given off to form it. In order to de destroy the gap, that energy has to be replaced. That energy is so large that it's not available normally, even at 1,000 degrees. The chain resonates, which allows the periodic emission of protons uh, in each direction. I'll show you that in detail. The electron reduces the Coulomb barrier. There has to be electron there. And when these two nuclei finally come together, that nuclei being right there as, as a necessity gets sucked into the reaction. And the 
nuclear reactions that I'm proposing are here. Now, tritium provides a, the key to understanding this process. And tritium also provides the way in which the process can be verified. Tritium is made uh, in these cold fusion cells. And, but tritium cannot be made by the hot fusion reaction because we're not seeing any neutrons. So it has to be made by some other process. Well, there are a limited number of ways in which you can make tritium. When you examine all of those, you discover that the only thing that really makes any sense is this, re what's, is this reaction here. The deuteron fuses with a proton, captures the electron, makes tritium, which then decays by its normal decay over with a half-life of 12.3 years uh, to helium-3 and an electron. Based upon assumption number two, all of the isotopes of hydrogen have to behave the same way. So that means the deuteron fuses with the electron, that makes hydrogen-4, which decays very, very rapidly, so we don't see that accumulate to make helium-4 and, of course, the electron uh, as part of the decay. And protium then would fuse with the electron to make deuterium, which is stable. Now, this reaction is very interesting because it provides a way of not only testing the model, but it has very <coughs> serious world, real-world consequences to the Rossi claims. If you make deuterium, that deuterium, deuterium will accumulate in the nuclear active environment, find a proton, combine, fuse together to make tritium. So we should see in an ECAP an accumulation of tritium. And not only just an accumulation, it should start slowly and accelerate as the concentration of deuterium goes up. Well, that's very important because if you don't take that into account and open an ECAT that has been making a large amount of energy and therefore contains a large amount of tritium and get a snootful, you're not going to be happy. And furthermore, the regulators, uh, when they find this out, that you're making all this radioactive tritium and not coming clean about it, uh, they're going to shut you down. So it's absolutely critical that tritium measurements be looked for, or tritium be looked for, in an ECAT. And if it's found, that unambiguously supports this model. All right, let's look at the, the way in which I imagine this to occur. This is the lattice. The uh, hydrogen, it doesn't matter whether it's protium or deuterium, is located within the, between the metal uh, nuclei, metal atoms in a random way, a, a gap forms by stress release. They accumulate and form this structure. This is a structure, covalent structure based upon the p-electron, 2p electron state. Uh, initially, th these are just vibrating in random ways like ordinary things do, but because it has a uh, linear structure, it can start to vibrate such that these two come together, these two further apart, these two come together, so forth. And, and then, alternately, these go further apart, these two come together. When these two come together, they find themselves too close. Uh, they, have, they have too much energy, too much mass for the distance, because they're on the way to having formed a, fu a fusion product. And so the question is, where during that process do they recognize that they have too much mass and have to get rid of it? When you do it by hot fusion, that's done very, very quickly and overwhelms this process. I'm proposing that this is the unique feature of cold fusion, the way in which that knowledge is communicated. Once it's understood, I predict will result in a Nobel Prize. This, this is where cold fusion differs from hot fusion. And so the, they alternately get close and further apart. They give off these protons in opposite direction to conserve momentum. Finally, enough's given off that each time they get a little closer, they give off a little bigger photon. And then eventually, they get close enough that they go together, 
suck this electron in, but there's hardly any mass energy left over at that point, so this becomes stable, or if not, gives off a very weak gamma. If this is deuterium, then, and these are protium, these will get together in random ways and generate tritium. If these are all deuterium, these will get together and generate helium. Okay, there are several predictions that can be made. There's scientific predictions and there's engineering predictions. And we'll talk about the scientific predictions first. I predict that the hydroton is metallic hydrogen. This is that mythical material that people have been looking for by squeezing hydrogen at very high pressure. And I'm saying that that is precisely what is formed in this gap. The gap makes that possible. The reason why metallic hydrogen has been very difficult to detect is because once it forms, it fuses. That's not too bad because the samples are very small, but it does uh, wreck the apparatus because they have diamond uh, anvils and they crack and they get uh, colored by color centers, presumably by the radiation given off by this process. So that allows us to harvest the mathematical understanding of metallic hydrogen, which is already in the literature, to explain this material and also relate what we're seeing to another kind of measurement. I'm saying that the heat claimed by Rossi and others using nickel and hydrogen is not the result of transmutation. Some transmutation may be occurring, but it's at a very low rate, and it does not, it does not have a rate sufficient to produce any kind of measurable heat. The measurable heat, is, in their case, is coming from the formation of deuterium. And tritium will be produced in increasing amount when hydrogen is used. And that also makes attractive the use of heavy hydrogen for future energy production, because that does not make tritium. And indeed, it produces much more energy for each reaction. All right, so let's look at the engineering consequences of this idea. In any engineering system, one has to identify the variables that you have control over and what effect they have on the basic process. We're not looking at the details of the reaction at this point. So let's uh, identify the variables. First of all, there's a constant in the equation. This is a power. And this is the equation that I propose describes the amount of power that's being produced under the various conditions. X is a constant related to the isotope present. If deuterium is present, of course, it has a big number. Um, if light hydrogen is present, it has a small number. But if light hydrogen is present, it's a variable because as the deuterium accumulates, it'll start producing tritium, which then has a higher energy for its production. A is the number of nuclear active environment. Well, it makes sense. The more places that the reaction can occur, the faster, the more often it will occur. That's just common sense. But that's the problem. Uh, if a material has no nuclear active environment, of course, it doesn't matter what else you do to it, it's not going to do anything. So that's the place where you have to concentrate. You just have to somehow or another figure out how to increase the number of nuclear active environment. That's the challenge. C is the concentration of hydrogen isotope in the material surrounding the nuclear active environment. Well, that makes sense. The more reactant you have in a system, the faster the reaction will go. Now, that's a variable also. If the sensitive to temperature, generally the higher the temperature, the lower the concentration. Uh, it's sensitive to the pressure. The higher the pressure in the system, the higher the concentration. Uh, it's sensitive to the current, for example, that applies through a, uh, that's passed through an electrochemical cell. It's, and also the current that goes through a gas discharge cell. So this is variable, but we know what to look for, and all of those variables are understood, understandable and can be incorporated into this concentration term. And finally, once the hydrogen's in there, it has to find, it has to get to 
the nuclear reactive environment. That, re that involves diffusion. And so, this, I'm uh, putting into this equation the equation that describes the, the, the temperature effect of diffusion. This is the heat of diffusion, this is the gas constant, this is temperature. Uh, diffusion will also be changed by a concentration gradient, by the uh, 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 application of a voltage. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that you increase the diffusion, and, and that's why the electromigration has an effect because it changes the rate at which the deuterium can find the nuclear active environment. All right, there's one other uh, equation, and that's how fast the energy can get out of the system. Now, there's various ways that can happen by radiation, by convection, by conduction. Uh, for simplicity's sake, we'll talk about it being uh, limited only by conduction in this particular example. And in that case, we have the thermal conductivity of the barrier times the temperature difference across it, defining the loss rate. All right, so let's put some numbers into these uh, equations that are arbitrary but plausible and see how it behaves. This is the power produced in watts, and this is the temperature in the environment of the nuclear active environment for this curve. That curve is based upon this equation here. Uh, these straight lines result from this equation, and they show the power being lost against the delta T plotted here. Now, so long as the power being produced here is less than the rate of that power can be produced by loss, the system will be stable, even though it has a positive temperature coefficient. Temperature goes up a little bit, that produces an increased delta T, which is more than enough to get rid of that energy. So it's stable. And this is the range that most experiments are done in. And you see it has a very modest temperature coefficient. But that's not a very interesting range. It's occurring at a very low amount of power. So Rossi said, OK, uh, I, I want to increase the amount of power. <clears throat> well, how am I going to do that? So he puts a resistor into his cell applies power, that causes the temperature to go up, and because it's going up, uh, it follows this line. Now, if uh, he goes too hot, uh, hotter than it's the system is capable of getting rid of heat, he will hit a runaway region where it will just simply go out of control and an explosion will result. And he's talked about that having happened. So he's got a problem. He wants to stay in this range as close as possible to that critical temperature, but with control. So he applies the heat, take, takes the temperature up, and then <clears throat> once it gets near that critical temperature, he turns the resistors off, and it cools back down. But he doesn't want to go too cold, so he turns it back on. So he's constantly going back and forth in this region here. Well, and because he has to apply energy to start with, <clears throat> he has to um, waste some energy. And so it's not self-sustaining. He gets a factor of six. The, if these equations are applied properly, it's possible to design a system <clears throat> that would be self-sustaining. Self and it is possible, using these equations, to design uh, a system very uh, nicely. How much more? Five minutes, OK. Uh, Pons and Fleischmann saw this effect early on. They had this one centimeter cube of palladium that they had been electrolyzing for a long period of time. And it was doing such no nothing that they could see. And then one day they came in, and the apparatus was destroyed. And the sample had melted its way through the beaker and gone into the floor. And that's what got them interested in this whole effect. That was very definite proof that they had a source of energy that was enormous. But what happened, the sample was surrounded by water, so it could get rid of its heat very readily. But it was making some energy down here. But overnight, it boiled, the water boiled away. And so the ability to get rid of the heat dropped. The thermal conductivity was reduced, uh, because now it was only in air or in uh, Yes, and so it started to heat, and it proceeded to heat 
uh, control, uh, as it heated, C would drop because it was going to higher temperature and it was losing deuterium, but it stayed up here long enough to destroy the apparatus and then cool down when they found it the next day. So that's the possible danger in this particular technology. Okay, well, we have another problem here that's, that's a little bit more of a challenge <laughs> for you, not for me, because I know what it looks like. Um, the, the, the challenge is to figure out what about the surface is universally related to a, a sample that makes excess energy, because you would expect to be able to identify something that is uniquely characteristic of an active surface. The problem is that these um, surfaces are covered with all kinds of crud. And if you look at them on the scale that you have to to see this, um, you can see almost anything. But after examining hundreds of these photomicrographs by other people and by myself, uh, there's a characteristic that is I find. And that is, you get a structure like this with holes in it. And all of these that, I, that you can't see, um, but hopefully you can imagine, uh, are surfaces with a similar kind of structure. Now, I don't believe that the holes themselves are the nuclear reactive environment. The holes are created by the process the sample uses to release the stress, because all of these samples were produced in such a way as to produce stress in that environment. And that stress produces a characteristic <coughs> morphology in the surface. I don't, so the holes themselves are not the active. They only give you the indication that that stress reorganized the surface. What I'm saying is that that stress also produced the nanocracks in the walls of these holes. And that's where you have to look to find the genie of cold fusion. <coughs> All right, so just to conclude, cold fusion is real. It's not related to hot fusion. It requires a significant change in the material to occur. And that getting that change in material has been the real big problem to make the effect reproducible. Once you can identify how to make the active sample reproducibly, it becomes a trivial uh, uh, effort. The present lack of progress is caused by an effective guidance to research. The theories are so bad that they really do not allow any kind of direction. We have to correct that. And you don't even have to believe my theory for me to be satisfied. You just have to not believe anybody else. <laughs> Now, all behavior using all isotopes of hydrogen can be explained by a single basic mechanism operating in a single nuclear active environment. It's un unnecessary to make up a lot of obscure, imaginative, creative explanations. You, you can do this very simply. The nuclear active structure is metallic hydrogen that forms in the nanogaps. The heat is generated by the formation of helium, tritium, and deuterium, depending upon which isotopes present. And transmutation results only as a consequence of the fusion reaction. It does not occur as an independent process. Now, I haven't talked about that, but that, that would be another lecture that could take all day. Um, but transmutation has to follow the same rules that apply to the fusion reaction. So anyway. Um, Thank you very much, and if you have any questions. Well, since you dismissed all of the theory at the jump, <laughs> yeah. including mine. Yeah, well, I apologize for that, but it's nothing personal. I agree with you that your theory jump until you prove to me how does the weak interaction can give large reaction rate? All of your process involve weak interaction. And uh, as you know, it's a certain order 
many to smarter than the strong in that. To get the rate we are observing, you cannot possibly bring in a weak induction process to explain. You have to show me how you did your calculation to show that the rate is okay. Okay, well that's... Instead of, instead of taking someone else, I think you should do your homework first. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, that's fair. And, and what I'm saying, since I'm not a theoretician, and so I don't have the mathematical tools available to me to answer your question precisely, and in fact, I also argue that they're not unnecessary once the concept is accepted. Uh, anybody will find justification in math to explain anything. So the, the, uh, the challenge that I'm offering here is only that, okay, Please look for tritium. People are not looking for tritium. If you look for tritium and you find tritium, then we'll talk. Because then that this theory has legs that no other theory would have. And then we'll start talking to mathematicians to justify it. My theory is tritium as well. Your, your theory predicts tritium by introducing a few ad hoc assumptions, but I can, if, it's, if your theory is right, if your theory is right, then the, tr the tritium will have a particular characteristic. Don't affect the theory without referring to the Um, uh, given that it came from someone as distinguished and respected as yourself, um, I, d I think there was one error in your presentation about the explosion of Rossi's reactor rather than the meltdown. And I think on a public point of view, if that got out from yourself, I think it, it, would, it would get undue weight. So I think it's a meltdown rather than an explosion. I'm willing to be corrected. Well, Fiscati in his uh, description, uh, in his lectures, described it as an occasional uh, explosion. I mean, that's, that's his words. Uh, it's, I mean, we're not talking about a big event like a nuclear bomb. We're talking about a normal explosion that occurs you know, in a chemical laboratory. Because once this gets out of control and gets too hot, it starts to turn off. And the explosion is caused by the increased gas pressure that's generated, not by the nuclear reaction. It's, right, right. It's a very safe technology, by the way. Thank you very much.